Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Script Apart. My name's Al Horner, and I hope wherever you're listening, you're having a relaxing festive break. As a very unhinged, axe-wielding man once furiously typed into a typewriter over and over again, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And though I may disagree with Jack Torrance in a lot of ways, you know, regarding his violent tendencies, I do think the guy had a point there. So wherever you're listening, I hope you're having a restful Christmas period. Today on the show, we're trying something new. I'm really excited about this. If you've tuned in before, you'll of course know that typically each episode, we're joined by an incredible screenwriter as they unpack their first draft of what became a beloved movie or episode of TV. For a while though, we've been wondering if there's a way for us to cover amazing screenplays by writers who are unable to appear on the show themselves. Either because that person is sadly no longer with us or whatever the reason may be. There are so many older scripts that we'd love to cover on the show, but that's not always possible in our usual format, which led us to the idea of something we're calling Script Club. It doesn't take a genius to unpack that name. It's basically a book club, but for screenplays, it's a bonus new episode format that we're really hyped to launch today. It basically involves every now and again, in addition to our regularly scheduled programming, a great filmmaker, a great storyteller, a friend of the show, coming on to pick a script that they adore by a screenwriter presently unable to appear on script part themselves. We're going to have a conversation about that film's storytelling secrets. We're going to talk about our guests' relationship to the screenwriter and their work and everything in between. It's going to be a lot of fun. Kicking off Script Club in a decidedly unfestive fashion, although I will say that today's movie is set in a snowy winter wonderland, so that counts for something. Um, this person was an important creative force at Pixar for 25 years. He co-directed films like Toy Story 2, Monsters Inc. and Finding Nemo, before stepping out as a solo director with Toy Story 3 and 2017's incredible Coco. Yes, today on the show, to discuss Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, one of my all-time favorite movies, it's Lee Unkrich. Ever since Lee was a teenager, he's been absolutely obsessed with The Shining, Kubrick's seminal horror movie about a family marooned in a malevolent hotel, co-written with novelist Diane Johnson and adapted from Stephen King's novel. It's an obsession that recently culminated in an epic three-volume book simply titled Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, co-written with the late J.W. Rinsler. I've had the pleasure of reading it, and honestly, this thing is incredible. Flicking through it is kind of the equivalent of the film's famous elevator scene, but instead of gallons of blood gushing towards you, we're talking exclusive interviews, unseen pictures, scans of Kubrick's notes while reading King's novel for the first time. It's insanely comprehensive. If you're a fan of this film, I can't recommend it enough. During his research, Lee was able to read draft after draft of the film's screenplay, gaining an unrivaled insight into Kubrick's creative process. In the episode you're about to hear, Lee recounts some of the biggest changes across all those different iterations of The Shining script. It's a list that includes a subplot involving a scrapbook that would have drastically changed the feel of the film, some flashback scenes involving violent altercations at Jack Torrance's school, and a number of blood-soaked alternative endings that saw practically every character meet a grisly end Yes, even poor little Danny. A huge thank you to Lee for being so generous with his time and insights. Uh, thank you also to Sam Clements for arranging it so that we could record this one in person over tea and coffee at London's Picture House Central Cinema. Um, can I also take a moment to say thank you to you guys, the listeners, for tuning in this year. This week we were named one of Apple's best loved podcasts of 2022. We were also included in GQ Australia's favorite shows of the year, which is insane to me. Um, the fact that people are listening on the other side of the planet to me is wild, let alone naming us in a roundup of 2022's best podcasts over there. So thank you. We could not do it without your support. Once again, we really do appreciate all you guys tuning in. Okay, let's jump into it. This is Lee Unkrich on Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Do let us know what you think about this. As I say, it is a bit of an experiment, something new for us. I really hope you enjoy it. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Lee, pleasure to have you with us. Huge congratulations on the book, first and foremost. Um, it's, a, it's a decade long endeavor that I've, I've had the joy of reading recently and I can, I can confirm is totally worth the wait. Um, one thing that really struck me 
was uh, how fun it was reading Kubrick's notes and getting a sense of the, the exuberance uh, of him in the midst of his creative process. Like th there are so many scans of pages of notes of his in this book where he's all excitement and uh, exuberation, exclamation marks all over the place. Uh, and that's kind of in contrast to uh, the public persona that, that he kind of presented a lot of the time. Was, was kind of getting an in intimate glimpse at the master filmmaker and the person he really was. Was that one of the real delights for you of working on this project for so long? It really was. Um, <clears throat> what spending all the time that I spent uh, researching and uh, you know, spending time in the Kubrick archive and pouring through Stanley's notes and as you say, you know, having a glimpse into his, his thought process via you know his note his personal notes on copies of Stephen King's novel and uh, you know the various iterations of uh, and drafts of the screenplay. Um, it really humanized Stanley uh, for me in a way that he never had been before. You know, we all like to put uh, Kubrick up on this pedestal uh, as being this brilliant filmmaker who, um, you know, was meticulous, and uh, um, I think there's a perception that he just cooked up these films in his mind and then just executed them flawlessly and, and gave them <laughs> to the world. But the reality is, is, you know, he was a, he was a, a, a creative like any of us who struggled at times and didn't all have, always have the answers. And that became very clear to me. And in fact, looking through, um, you know, his notes in the archive, I really saw a lot of parallels to my own work and my own creative process and the struggles that I've gone through over the years as I've developed different stories. And it just shows you that, I, you know, I don't care who you are, storytelling is very difficult. <laughs> um, and Stanley, Stanley was no different. Uh, in fact, he was, he was actually well into production on The Shining before he even knew how he was going to end the film, which is gobsmacking to me. <laughs> Because I, you know, I'm of a mind that I, I need to at least know my ending. I need an ending, and I need to know what I'm painting towards. I, I can't, I couldn't imagine going into production without knowing how I was going to end something. And The Shining is not the only case where that happened with him. Um, Matthew Modine kept diaries during the making of Full Metal Jacket, and you hear the same stories there that Stanley just was kind of tortured by figuring out how to end the film. Um, so it, very, very interesting to, to kind of see the vulnerability behind the, the genius sheen. <laughs> what were some of those parallels that you mentioned? Um, just, just the notion of, uh, not always having the answers and often going down blind alleys, um, you know, uh, exploring story ideas that don't pan out, um, where, you know, I, I've experienced it firsthand times where I've you know, spent months developing, uh, you know, a, a, a path through a story only to ultimately realize that I had hit a dead end and that that wasn't the answer. Um, I never consider it wasted time because uh, I always get to know my characters better in the process. And very often you pick up little things along the way that even though you're backing out and you're going to now head in a different direction in your storytelling, um, there are elements that you can then make use of, you know, as you kind of reconceive. And, and I saw the same thing with, uh, you know, with The Shining, uh, uh, with Stanley. Um, I mean, he, he, I talk about this in the book, but he, Stanley talked about the fact that he didn't think a great movie could be made from a great novel. Because he thought all the, 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 the best novels, uh, the part of why they were great was because of the language and because of the, um, the, uh, the inner lives of the characters that are things that are hard to express through film. Um, so in finding the shining Stephen King's novel, uh, Stanley really loved the plotting of the story and he loved the situation, but there were a lot of things he didn't like about the novel. And you can see that in his notes on Stephen King's pages. I mean, he, he gives King a lot of credit, you know, you, you'll see notes where he says, oh, this is a brilliant idea or very clever. Um, but then just as often you'll see him scribble stupid dialogue <laughs> or, you know, you don't need to say this, you know. So he's, he's already thinking ahead, even when he's reading the novel about how he might adapt it. But it, 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 that said, it, you know, reading the novel and scribbling notes is really just the beginning of the process for him.
So to, to take it all back to the beginning, you discovered The Shining, I think, shortly before your 13th birthday, right? Yeah, I was 12 years old. Uh, I saw it in the th theaters when, uh, when it came out in 1980. And uh, my mom took me to see it. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know who Kubrick was. I didn't know who Stephen King was. Um, I don't even know why she took me to it. I don't know <laughs> if she was aware of who Kubrick was. Um, and I'm actually surprised she took me because she had taken me to see another scary film a couple of years earlier. And <clears throat> I had had like nonstop nightmares for a full year <laughs> from that other film. <laughs> and <clears throat> so the, I, I wish I remembered more about seeing The Shining for the first time. The only thing I really remember is my mom turning to me and asking if I was okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was. Um, I, I was just um, completely absorbed by the film. Um, and I, I do remember in the, in the days afterwards thinking about it a lot. And a few days later, um, I purchased a, a paperback copy of Stephen King's novel. It was the movie tie-in edition. It had Saul Bass's yellow and black um, poster art on the front. And uh, I, I ended up falling into that novel and, and just becoming completely obsessed with it as well. And I was fascinated by how different it was from the film that I'd seen. You know, it obviously shared a lot of common um, elements, but they were very different stories. And I, but I found I kind of was fascinated by both equally. And that fascination has endured now for decades. Have you ever been able to pinpoint why? Like that's something that isn't explained in this sort of, the, there's a beautiful introduction to the book in which you talk about your relationship with the film and your, your admiration of the craft, but you don't really delve into sort of what you think it was about the story that this particular film that, that chimed with you in such a way. Have you ever got close to the answer for that? Yeah, I thought about it a lot because, I mean, even this morning I was talking to my wife and I was like, this is crazy. Like, why why have I been so obsessed with one film for, for decades? Like, it, it just seems so nuts. And, and I have moments where I think, how much time have I wasted from my life just <laughs> uh, thinking about this film? But I've enjoyed every moment of it. Um, Thinking back, I think that when I saw the film for the first time, subconsciously, I think I really related to a lot of elements in it because I'm an only child. My parents uh, had a very um, uh, complicated, messy marriage. Um, there was a lot of tension. Uh, there was a lot of fighting. Um, and then on top of that, I, I, because both of my parents worked, I was home alone a lot. And I had a really vivid imagination. Um, and unfortunately, that imagination often led to dark places. I, I, I was afraid of a lot of things in my house. I knew what it was like to be alone in a house and be frightened. Um, and so I think seeing The Shining, <laughs> between Danny being an only child, uh, you know, parents that are fighting, being alone in this isolated hotel that has scary things in it, I think it just, it kind of just mainlined right into my psyche in a way that I didn't understand at the time. But I, I really think that's probably a big part of, um, it because, and because it happened at kind of a formative moment. You know, I was 12 years old. I was, I was just on the cusp of maybe becoming the person who I am now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all those things together conspired. It was kind of like a perfect storm. And how did it intersect with uh, you then kind of developing a sense of, I want to be a storyteller, I want to direct films? Well, that really came out of, I also mark The Shining as being the first film that I can remember seeing that I wasn't just watching some entertainment on screen. Um, I, I was aware of the hands of an artist behind the camera. So the more that I grew interested in The Shining, I then, of course, started to seek out other Kubrick films. And the more Kubrick films I watched, I started to realize that there was a, there was a common feeling across many of them. That was a combination of, uh, you know, his, his visual compositions, his use of music, his sound design, um, the, the, the mannered performances, um, the kind of slow, deliberate editing. I mean, a lot of these things I, I was feeling across the films. And so uh, I, 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 for the first time, was thinking about like what a filmmaker does and what a filmmaker can bring to their own work to make it personal. And so I really marked that as the beginning of me thinking about 
the fact that maybe that was something that I wanted to do in my life. And so that just blossomed into me, you know, starting to watch lots of films voraciously. And uh, eventually when I was in high school, starting to think about, you know, going to film school. And, um, you know, in, in terms of like how subtly the film and Kubrick's work at, at large may have kind of influenced you, uh, Kubrick believed that ghosts are inherently optimistic. And there's a delightful story that King once told about how Stanley called him up at 7 a.m. one morning to suggest that supernatural stories all posit the same basic suggestion that we survive death. If we survive death, that's optimistic, isn't it? And that belief feels like a component of Coco, which is a film I love, Lee, um, which, which leads me to wonder, yeah, what influence you would say The Shining has had on your storytelling? Like, obviously, at first glance, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, connective tissue between the Pixar movies that you're famous for and, and of course, this, the most terrifying story of all time, the ter most terrifying movie of all time. But yeah, perhaps there's, there is some sort of, some way that Kubrick and his approach to movie making and storytelling has been something you've been able to apply to your own work. Well, certainly in terms of his craft, he's had a big influence on me. I mean, I find myself all the time, whether I'm aware of it or not, making choices that I, if, I, if I'm to stop and think about it, um, I know that they were probably influenced by Kubrick. Mm -hmm. Whether that's how I frame a shot, um, whether it's, you know, how I use a piece of music, um, from a storytelling standpoint, I don't know. I don't think there was a lot of influence because the kinds of stories I've told at Pixar are so different than <laughs> yeah. the kinds of stories that Kubrick told. Although you have managed to sneak in a good number of Easter eggs. Well, that's just a good bit of fun, <laughs> right? Yeah. I've always liked to hide little Kubrickian and specifically, uh, shining related Easter eggs in the films that I've made. Mm. Um, it's just, it's just fun. You know, um, if, if people recognize them and see them, hopefully it delights them. And uh, some of them people have really never seen. So I just know that they're there <laughs> and, uh, and have a bit of fun with that. It's a shame almost that um, Kubrick never made an animated movie because I think the, the meticulousness that's part of his craft in which every single element of the frame is always so considered animation has a sense of that, you know, because you're creating every frame from scratch, like, the, the amount of control, I think, having got, got to know Kubrick quite well, seemingly through your book, it feels like, instinctively, I feel like he would have enjoyed the process. Of yeah, I'm glad you said that because I've thought about that myself. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's no, you know, he, Kubrick probably never would have made an animated film. But you're absolutely right. And, and it's why I've enjoyed working in animation. I didn't train to be an, an, an animator. You know, I went to traditional film school and all the work I did prior to Pixar was live action. Uh, and Pixar just kind of happened <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> and, you know, I ended up doing that for 25 years. But the thing that I loved the most about making all the films that I worked on was that degree of control. Yeah. You know, I found in live action there was constant compromise, um, you know, and I, and I hear stories from lots of directors uh, in live action about how difficult it is to have a vision in your mind. I, I, I've heard stories about Steven Spielberg um, that he, he, he doesn't like to watch his films once they're finished because it's too painful. Because all he sees are the compromises. All he, all he sees are all the things that he had dreamt and was excited about getting into the film that he wasn't able to. Um, and I, I found with my films at Pixar that I, for the most part, whatever I dreamt up, whatever I wanted on screen, I could get on screen and I could hone it and shape it. And, you know, my crew has sometimes called me a control freak, uh, <laughs> which some people might see as a negative. I see it as <laughs> a positive. Um, and, you know, Stanley was a control freak, certainly, but in a good way. I mean, he had a vision and he had high standards for himself and he pushed everyone around him to meet those standards. Which again, you get very much a sense of in this book. The, the book is very focused on the making of rather than analysis of what The Shining is about. And I'm aware that kind of that approach was steered by, you know, ever since you were a kid, there's been this scarcity of information about how, about how The Shining was made. Uh, I'd love to ask though, as someone who knows this movie and its creation inside out, uh, what you make of the fact that it that it has become this kind of like cinematic psychological Rorschach test of sorts, you know, all these decades later, people are still interpreting it in all these different ways. And it, it sounds like that was by design. Kubrick was was really compelled, I discovered from the book, by by Freud's concept of the uncanny. 
Um, so yeah, how would you describe the way in which like the longevity of this film is in it is in part informed by yeah the mysteries surrounding it and the mo the multitude of ways in which it can be interpreted and, and viewed through different lenses. Well, I, I I think most of that comes from all the ambiguities in the film and all the unanswered questions. Um, that combined with the fact that that people have a belief that every last thing, every frame in a Kubrick film is there by design. So if something doesn't make sense, people say, oh that must be by design. And then they want to dive into that and, and dissect it and try to figure out what Kubrick was thinking or what he was trying to say. And I think very often Kubrick himself probably didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's an anecdote in the book where uh, Stanley shot a shot and then kind of turned with a wink to a crew member and said, let's let the fil French film critics figure that one out. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> And when I look at the writing process as he slowly honed and shaped uh, the screenplay, and then beyond that, you know, in, through production and then especially in the editorial process, I see a filmmaker who is constantly taking things out. Mm. He, and he's taking things out that I think that he thinks are tying things up in neat little bows because he wants the audience to think. He wants the audience to interpret um, what he's created and not give them easy answers. I, I, you know, I just watched the film again last night. I hadn't seen it up on the big screen in, in quite a while. And coming off of having created this book, it was great to watch it again. And uh, there's a little side note, but um, Steven Spielberg uh, graciously wrote the foreword for the book, yeah, uh, which I'm very happy about. And he says something at the end of his foreword. Uh, he says something to the effect of, you must read this book. And the moment you finish reading it, uh, you need to watch The Shining again. And I don't care if you've seen it 50 times, um, you're never going to see it the same way again. It's, this book's going to change everything. Uh, so I was thrilled <laughs> that he said that, of course. But watching the film last night, I really understood what he was getting at. Because for me, watching it for the first time, now that I know all of the scenes that Stanley shot for the film, but then didn't use... Uh, took out while he was editing it, I can kind of imagine those scenes there at some of the transitions. And as a filmmaker, it leads me to think, okay, why did he take that scene out? How is it not serving his storytelling? How is it affecting the pacing in a negative way? Um, I mean, these are all the decisions you make as a filmmaker when you're cutting, you know, what doesn't need to be there, all the things that you thought needed to be part of the story that don't actually need to be there. And I found that most of the things that Stanley took out were uh, things that maybe explain things a bit more. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so that, that's what has led to, I think, all the rampant speculation about the meanings and the analysis and everything. And there's plenty of it out there. Um, and uh, as you said, I wanted to just tell the story of the making of the film. I didn't want to kind of throw my hat into the ring with my own analysis because it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I don't think anybody's analysis matters. It's fun to read, but you know, it's a personal experience for everyone watching the film and, and, and you know, drawing from it what they do. And I suppose you've had, as a director, a certain experience of that same kind of uh, like cottage industry of speculation and theorizing, sometimes quite outlandishly. It's happened a bit. I mean, I there were there were a bunch of people writing about how Toy Story three was a, a Holocaust was a Holocaust analogy. analogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I first heard that from the the man who at the time was the the president of the uh, the, the Hollywood Foreign Press, the people who do the Golden Globes. Um, I was about to head into a little kind of press conference with them and. And he said that to me, and it just like completely knocked me sideways because, of course, it wasn't an intention at all, and and I thought it was a bit of a stretch, like a, a big stretch. But the more I saw people writing about it, I just I found it interesting, and uh, I think it's cool. I think it's cool to put art out into the world, and you know, once once you've released it, once you've finished it, it's it's kind of no longer yours. Um, it belongs to all the individuals who watch it and, and, and draw from it what they want to draw from it. And it, it doesn't matter, frankly, yeah. whether, you know, the fact that I didn't intend something at all or wasn't even thinking about it or maybe put an idea into a film subconsciously, 
it doesn't matter that uh, that it wasn't intentional because it can still be part of um, how people digest the film. Yeah, totally. I mean, not to linger on it too long, but you know, when I th when I think about things like uh, the Room Two Three Seven documentary uh, that kind of collates all these different theories about about The Shining, like on one hand, I'm like, I, I really don't think Kubrick was hiding a confession about uh, him faking the Apollo moon of landing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I kind of appreciate the sort of serendipity, I suppose, of like a film takes on a new meaning depending on who it's reaching, the time of their life that it's reaching them. And I don't know, it's something to be celebrated. Yeah, I, think, I actually, I know Rodney Asher and Tim Kirk who, who made that film. Room oh, great. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people poo-poo the film because they think that the, the film is putting forward all these theories as valid theories, when in reality, the film is really meant to be a, an exploration of how far down the rabbit hole people can do in yeah, analyzing yeah. a film or a piece of art. Um, so yes, I mean, most of the ideas in that film are, are completely crazy, but they're not all crazy. And here's the thing, <laughs> here's the thing that is tricky. Stanley did hide things in The Shining. Yeah. You know, Stanley, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Stanley and Diane Johnson, who wrote the screenplay with him, spent a lot of time talking about Freud and, and Freud's essay on the uncanny and thinking about what are the elements that can elicit an uncanny feeling in a, in a viewer, in an audience. And I, I, can, I know for a fact from Stanley's notes that he was thinking about that and he was trying to create moments of uncanniness. And one of the ways that he did it was through number play. Yeah. Uh, you know, repeated numbers, um, repeated names, names coming up. I, mean, I think even the fact that Jack Nicholson and Jack Torrance share the same name and Danny Lloyd and Danny Torrance share the same name, these were things that delighted Stanley. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that he chose 237 um, rather than room 217, which is the number, uh, the room number in Stephen King's novel. Um, Stanley was asked to change the room number by one of the hotels that inspired The Shining mm. because the, the hotel didn't want people to not want to stay in that one room. <laughs> but Stanley could have picked any other number. Um, he picked 237, and 237 um, becomes a part of this really interesting number play that you see throughout The Shining, um, having to do with like the number uh, 42 and 24 and if you take 237 and multiply it together, 2 times 3 is 6 times 7 is 42. And Danny has a 42 on his sleeve of his shirt that he's wearing at the beginning of the film. Um, it's easy to say that stuff's nuts and no one was thinking about it. But um, I've seen Stanley's uh, scribbles yeah, uh, where you see him writing down, oh, maybe, uh, maybe 217 could be the character's address, you know? Um, he, he was writing some of these things down. I even see a moment where he delights in the fact that his initials, SK, are the same as Stephen King's, SK. Yeah, yeah. So he was thinking about these things. And the fact that he was put, definitely putting some things in opens the floodgates for people wanting to think that everything that's in the film was by design. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. And it's one of the joys about you know, going back to these early early documents where it's all very much in its early days as a as a project, you start to see the intentionality. And so, for example, you know, one of the grand theories about about the film, or one of the things that's captivated people, is the sort of th this sense of like there's some sort of comment perhaps being made about uh, America's past because there is all this sort of Native American design. Now, from from the earliest outline. Um, He's, he's writing that on the page and he's describing the sort of Native American motif of the design of the hotel and all these kind of different things. Maybe that's a good place to begin as we kind of like delve into some of the, the actual scenes and some of the elements of the movie itself. That, that whole motif, like this idea that um, there, the Overlook is, it was built on uh, a Native American uh, Indian, Indian burial, burial ground, yeah. I think he says. Mm -hmm. So there's a narrative purpose to it. As someone who's got to know the film so well over the years, like, do you think it was also, was there some sort of expression there? Was there something that Stanley was exploring uh, thematically, do you think? Well, again, there's no way of knowing for certain. I, I have talked to Diane Johnson about it, and she said they did have conversations about, uh, you know, the Native American genocide, and, and, and they did talk about it. She didn't tell me that they were talking about it in terms of like, how is this going to influence the story? It was more that they would have conversations about it, which led her to believe, led her to believe that 
it was something Stanley was thinking about it, even if he wasn't going to articulate those ideas specifically in the film. Um, you know, it, it was something he was thinking about, and it did drive decisions all across the film, from production design um, through, uh, you know, th there's a whole element in the, in, the, in the novel that Stanley actually made part of the film and ultimately took out, where uh, Jack Nicholson's character finds a scrapbook an old scrapbook that kind of contains newspaper clippings outlining the, the uh, or recounting the sordid history of the Overlook Hotel and all the violence that happened there. And um, I recreated uh, a bunch of those uh, clippings in as part of this Tashin project because the original scrapbook no longer exists. Um, but a lot of the ephemera and um, text and clippings in progress exist in the, in the Kubrick archive. And what I found was that a lot of the early articles um, have to do with, uh, you know, Indian burials and, and, you know, finding bones on the property and, um, you know, uh, murders happening involving uh, Native Americans. And so he, he was definitely thinking about it. I can't speak to, you know, what his interest was or, uh, I mean, a lot of people have talked about it, but I, there's, of course, no way of knowing uh, you know, what Stanley w was getting at. If anything, I just think it was, it offered in, on some level a bit of an explanation for why there are ghosts at the Overlook or, you know, what it is about the Overlook that makes it this nexus of uh, kind of paranormal activity. And actually, you mentioned Diane there. We should, we should speak about Diane because she, she had a great, great influence on this, on this, uh, on this film. Um, I've never managed to track down a copy of the Shadow Never, the Shadow Knows, which mm -hmm. is the novel which compelled Kubrick to to hire her to co-write The Shining. Um, for a second, he was even contemplating adapting that book instead of The Shining. Well, yeah, Diane Diane says that. I haven't seen any other um, evidence that yeah. that was the case, but that is what Diane says that Stanley had been considering her novel as well. Um, that is a kind of a paranormal story. Um, and, and Diane at the time was also teaching a, a course on um, uh, Gothic uh, horror literature. Um, so, you know, Stanley loved surrounding himself with uh, great thinkers and, 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 you know, he was a great thinker himself. And um, I, think, I think the two of them were really evenly matched. Um, Diane had never written a screenplay before. Yeah. And so she came into that situation really... I think not knowing quite what she was getting into, um, but uh, I, she loved the process, and and you know she talks in the book about how much she learned by sitting with with Stanley and and uh, you know going through the process of taking a novel and kind of ripping it down to its studs and then rebuilding it as a as a film story, which is a very different kind of a story than a novel. Um, and uh, she saw some parallels to her own writing process, but a lot of things were very new. Stanley very much by that point had a, a method. He had a methodology for um, kind of beating out his stories and working uh, kind of in outline form for a very long time before they ever got to writing any scenes. And uh, regardless of whether Kubrick really was exploring adapting The Shadow Knows, it, it, it's certainly true that he was looking for, he was voraciously consuming books, looking for the, the next story he could adapt. What do you think it was about The Shining that, that chimed with Kubrick, despite his, his slight disregard for King's writing? We've obviously talked about how like, he recognized that it was a great story. He loved the plotting of it. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of the party line is that Kubrick wanted to explore something gothic, having had designs on, on making a horror movie since he, was, since he was a teenager. I think the, the line in the book that I really liked was uh, about how he, as a teenager, I think had designs on, on making a movie so scary that if you managed to sit through it, you got your money back which is really fun. True story, not as a teenager, but it was when he was a kind of a young filmmaker. Oh, I see. Right, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yes, he, he wanted to, he, yes, he had that idea of, <laughs> of doing that. Um, I, you know, Stanley was interested in working in any genre. You know, he, his family would come to him, his daughters would come to him and say, Dad, you should make a musical or you should make a kid's movie. And his response was always, great, give me a story. Hand me something. You know, what should I do? Uh, what's going to be interesting. So he was open to anything and he never really wanted to repeat himself. I mean, that, that was definitely part of his calculus mm. when he was trying to find a new property. Um, with The Shining, Stanley was coming off of Barry Lyndon, which was a big box office failure. And the way Stanley worked, you know, to be able to work 
uh, so meticulously and slowly and have such complete creative control over his projects. Um, it meant that he had to be really fiscally responsible, right? He, you know, if he kept losing money for the studios, he wouldn't be able to keep making movies or he certainly wouldn't be able to keep mo making movies the way he wanted to make them. So I, I think part of his calculus with The Shining was that because of Barry Lyndon's box office failure, he wanted to try to give Warner Brothers a big hit. And so I, th I know that he was kind of in search of a, kind of a bigger, more commercial uh, property. Um, there's an apocryphal story that's all over the internet about Stanley voraciously reading books and uh, his secretary hearing him throw them against the wall every time he kind of, kind of gave up on them. Yeah. And then finally one day she didn't hear any more thumps of books and it was because he had found The Shining. And it's a completely not true story. <laughs> not true at all. Um, I have all the receipts of, of Stanley being sent the early galleys of Stephen King's novel before it was even published. And Back when it was know, still called The Shine. It was called The Shine initially yeah. before it was published. And, um, you know, the, 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 the executives at Warner Brothers saying, we really think this could be a, a, a great new film for you. Um, uh, so he really took to it. And, you know, he'd always wanted to work with Jack Nicholson. And I think he saw in Jack... Again, an opportunity to have a really, you know, Jack was one of the biggest movie stars on the planet at the time. And uh, so that all fed into his desire, I think, to have a big hit. Um, but, of course, Stanley Kubrick is Stanley Kubrick. And so the what, what was a kind of big, kind of popular, um, easily digestible novel then was transformed into more of an enigmatic uh, piece <laughs> of cinema art. And uh, do, do you think there was anything on a primal level that... Um Kubrick was able to, to that yeah, that resonated with Kubrick, I suppose. Like the, the, the book was, of course, informed by, by writer's block and, and the fear of a, a creative tap in, in King being suddenly turned off. He, he describes having this shock at the, the surges of mental violence that he felt as a result of that frustration in his family life. Um, over, the, over the years of research that you put into The Shining and into Kubrick, uh, did, you, did you come across him as someone who, who did suffer from writer's block? Was that something he would have been able to res uh, sort of identify with? Yeah, if, if, I don't think Stanley had writer's block. I think, if anything, he had kind of film block. You know, he, he was very tortured uh, about what his next film was going to be after he finished one um, because he knew he was going to be heading into years of work. Um, and he, you know, also wanted what he picked to be the right project. So his wife, Christiana, talks about how tortured he would be about making that decision about what he was going to dive into. Um, with The Shining, interestingly, um, one of the biggest changes that, that he made from Stephen King's novel was kind of the relationship between Jack and Wendy and what that dynamic was. And Stanley really kind of reinvented that, that relationship um, in a way that, you know, Stephen King was very angry about it, and a lot of fans of King's book didn't like the changes that Stanley made. But I think Stanley was just pursuing ideas that were interesting to him. Even back then, um, Stanley was, uh, had been kicking around and thinking a lot about the source material that would ultimately end up being Eyes Wide Shut. He was very fascinated with the idea of marriages and, um, and the dynamics of marriages. And I think he saw in The Shining an opportunity to explore that a little bit in his own way. Um, you know, I think he liked the idea that this was a marriage that was already greatly in trouble before the movie even started. And traveling to the Overlook really was just kind of the, the hair that breaks the camel's back. Uh, hair? Straw. <laughs> the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, uh, which is very different than the novel. Yeah. Um, but again, it's just speaking to, I mean, any filmmaker, I mean, a filmmaker can just take a novel and adapt it and just kind of like bring their skills to the table to tell that same story. But that wasn't Stanley. You know, Stanley wanted to explore things that were personally interesting to him. And so he very much imposed that onto his adaptation of The Shining. Kubrick once said that, uh, I would say King's great ability is in plot construction he doesn't seem to take great care in writing. It seems like he writes it once, reads it, maybe writes it again, then sends it off to his publisher. Kubrick was quite the opposite from the sounds of it. And uh, I, I know that you poured through many, many drafts of The Shining as part of your research, Lee. How would you sum up the kind of major differences between those early documents you first saw 
and sort of the finished film. You, sure. you mentioned the scrapbook, obviously, which is a major thing we can talk yeah. about. Yeah. Well, first off, let me say that I think that was probably a, a very unfair thing for Stanley to have said about Stephen <laughs> I know, Perry. right? <laughs> but, uh, but he said it, so. Um, yeah, he, the, he and Diane really, like I said, ripped the novel down to the studs and, and were doing a lot of reinvention from the very beginning. Um, Diane told me that there were, and, and I saw evidence in some of these drafts that at one point Stanley was interested in potentially having Jack kill Wendy and Danny. Yeah. And, and, and that he himself would die. And that at the end of the film, it would be say a year later and the hotel manager would be touring around a, a new caretaker. And during that tour, we would see Jack and Wendy and Danny sitting at a table eating, uh, showing that they were now part of the hotel. Um, they realized pretty quickly, Stanley realized pretty quickly that, uh, you know, killing Danny was not the way to go. I mean, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, Stanley was a very warm, caring man and, uh, and he really loved children. And uh, he realized that that was just too horrible of a thing to do, even, even though it might be an intriguing way to kind of change the novel. I think he was also interested in um, upsetting people's expectations. You know, people were going to be going into it thinking they were just going to see Stephen King's novel. And I think Stanley probably delighted in surprising people. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there were a number, uh, there are a number of things. I mean, there, there are whole flashback elements in the novel uh, where we learn about the fact that before he worked at the Overlook, Jack was a teacher at a, high, at a private school and he had uh, had an altercation with a student where he actually beat up the student and That's right, got yeah. fired from the school. I mean, it's all part of the novel. And, and, and Stanley was exploring that initially. I mean, he, there are early outlines where we have these flashbacks and you see this part of Jack's life. Um, and again, it, it became a process of him slowly winnowing these away and realizing, just trying to get to the core essence of what was necessary to tell the story. And he ultimately decided that, that, that those ideas were extraneous and not necessary for his telling of The Shining. Um, trying to think of some other ideas. Uh, oh, there was, there was one uh, really interesting change that, that they kept for quite a while that you see through the drafts, which is that there was a version where when Jack is kind of after Wendy near the end of the film, she actually manages to, to stab him, to stab Jack and seemingly kill him. Um, and, and all of that storytelling at the end of the film is in her cut as it is in the film now with Scatman Crothers character, Dick Halloran, making his way to the Overlook, being this kind of um, knight in shining armor who's gonna show up and kind of rescue everyone. Uh, and in this, particular early telling of the story, Stanley had Jack get killed, then Dick Halloran shows up, and rather than rescuing them, it's revealed that he's doing the, the hotel's bidding, that he was being drawn to the hotel the whole time to take care of what the hotel knew Jack was going to be incapable of taking care of, yeah, which is yeah. killing Danny so that the hotel could absorb his powers. Um, uh, and that, was, that idea was around for a good long while. Um, in fact, they went into production uh, with the whole ending not worked out um, in many ways. In fact, Scatman Crothers, who plays Dick Halloran, <clears throat> he came at the beginning of production to, to England, to Elstree, and he shot all his early scenes where he, uh, say, talks to Danny in the kitchen and they have that whole conversation about what The Shining is. Um, he shot all his scenes and then he was released and he went back to the States and uh, it was many, many, many months before he was finally called back. At the time he went back to the States, he was under the impression that when he came back, he was going to be shooting the scene where Dick shows up and rescues Wendy and Danny, as he does in the novel. Yeah. Uh, only to be told, no, you're going to be murdered the moment you walk <laughs> in the front door. Uh, he was actually not happy about that change, but yeah. he recognized that it wasn't, you know, he really didn't have any say in the matter. He was a, a hired actor. Um, but, uh, I, I, and, and Diane actually wasn't involved in that decision because they were well into production. Diane wasn't a part of the writing anymore. So there were a lot of creative choices that Stanley was still making long after Diane had been involved. And so she was kind of as surprised as anybody by a lot of the changes <laughs> he had made. Um, I, I, you know, yes, it's disappointing for people who love the novel to see it play out differently, but I think it's kind of brilliant to spend so much screen time showing Dick 
get this psychic message from yeah. Danny and fly across the country. And I mean, he goes through hell and high water to get to the overlook. And literally the moment he walks in the door, he's killed. So, you know, he's Stanley's giving the audience hope that he's going to be the one person who can, who can, you know, remedy this horrible situation. <laughs> so the moment that Scatman, that Dick is killed, what are you left with? Yeah. I mean, they are truly on their own. There's nobody who can help Wendy at that point. And uh, I think that's a lot of fun <laughs> yeah. to, to have thrown the characters into that situation. Well, what's really wild about that is my, my first exposure to The Shining, because of you know, my age, was uh, through The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror parody of it. Mm -hmm. And I always assumed prior to watching The Shining, um, my mum unfortunately didn't let me watch it when I was 12. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I always assumed that that was kind of a riff on it and the, the sort of comedy of seeing, in, in The Simpsons case, groundskeeper Willie making this huge effort only to be like unceremoniously chopped down as soon as he arrives, that that was the kind of comic subversion. But then obviously you watch The Shining for the first time, you're like, oh, that's what really happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole idea of having the maze the hedge maze in the movie, that also was something that Diane wasn't involved in. All, all through the writing process, the whole concept of the maze wasn't part of uh, of the story. Again, yeah. because Stanley was much more concerned with kind of figuring out the structure of the film up to the, the climax of the ending um, than he was with the ending itself. He kind of left that um, unwritten. Um, Diane talks about the, the moment that Stanley kind of tells her that he's come up with this brilliant idea to, uh, I don't know if he said it was brilliant, but come up with the idea of, of having the hedge maze, um, which was kind of a reinvention of the hedge animals uh, in Stephen King's novel. Uh, it was much more Kubrickian, I think, for, yeah. for, for this idea of being kind of lost in, in, uh, in, in a maze um, and having this kind of cold, snowy, icy ending um, to the film rather than the the, the fiery inferno, which is the end of uh, Stephen King's novel. Um, but even with the maze, he, he hadn't, he didn't have everything worked out. Um, there are some echoes in the finished film of ideas that Stanley abandoned um, that I never noticed for years watching the film. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until I started reading these early drafts that I realized that um, they were part of the film. And, and a great example of that is, uh, Stanley had this idea that <clears throat> Danny was going to trap Jack in the maze, not by walking backwards through his own footsteps cleverly, as is in the finished film, but instead Danny was going to um, grab a hammer in the maze because there are these uh, triangle bells throughout the maze for people who get lost in the maze to be able to ring them. Danny was going to grab one of these hammers and then systematically smash out all of the lights, kind of plunging the maze into darkness. And he was then going to pull from his hip, from his holster, a toy phaser gun um, that had a, a light bulb in it. And he was going to light his way out uh, using this phaser. So when you watch the film now, right from the very beginning, the very first scene where you see Danny and Wendy um, eating lunch, there's, you can see the phaser sitting on the table. <laughs> it's right there. And then later, when Danny and Wendy go into the maze for the first time to explore it during the day, Danny has a, a, a holster on, on his hip. You can, if you look for it, it's right there. Yeah, And yeah. it's there because Stanley was trying to plant the seeds um, to allow the climax to work, the climax as he envisioned it. So at some point, he <laughs> abandoned that idea late in the game and, and ultimately came up with the idea of Danny walking backwards through his own footsteps to confuse Jack. Um, but he had already shot, you know, the whole front part of the movie. So, you know, he's not going to change it. <laughs> so he just, he left it as is. And it's this kind of very, I love it. It's this very intriguing, odd echo of another version of the movie that's right there in, in the same finished film. And the same holds true for the scrapbook. Yeah. You know, the scrapbook was a big idea in the novel. Um, that, that this, this Jack would kind of mysteriously find this scrapbook that had the whole history of the Overlook and he would be drawn into it and that was part of his enchantment. That's actually something that Diane Johnson really rused that, that, that Stanley had removed that. Um, and she didn't agree with that choice at all. She thought it was a, like a vital element to show the beginning of Jack's transformation. And I, I don't know that she's wrong. I don't think she's wrong because mm -hmm. when I watch the film now, one of, the, one of the criticisms people often have is that 
Jack starts kind of going nuts seemingly out of nowhere. It just kind of happens and it happens kind of abruptly. Um, and it, it wasn't always that way. I mean, the scrapbook and him being drawn into it and sharing it with Wendy, there were many scenes shot having to do with the scrapbook. And by removing it, he, he, did, he does leave everything much more ambiguous. And maybe he thought that was fine. Maybe he thought it was fine for it to be completely ambiguous. Uh, why Jack was going nuts. Like it, He didn't want to say definitively that it was the hotel doing it. Maybe Jack always had that within himself. Yeah, uh, I think he liked that, again, that it wasn't an easily answered question. But back to the scrapbook, when, when uh, Stanley decided to remove that as a story element, he had already shot a lot of the movie. So again, when you watch the film, from a certain point on, suddenly there's a big scrapbook laying on Jack's writing <laughs> desk. Yeah, You can see it, it's right there. And not only is it there, there are scenes like the scene where Wendy comes in and interrupts his writing and Jack kind of really cruelly yells at her. The angle on Jack, the bottom third of the frame is the scrapbook in the foreground. Stanley framed it that way intentionally, you know, to show that the, the, the kind of the power that this, this, this scrapbook in the hotel was having over him. Um, but it's not a story element anymore. So it's kind of gone. And again, you're left with these kind of odd echoes, ghosts of a, another version of the film. That was a big thing that I found fascinating in dissecting the, the, the process of creating the film. Well, yeah, one, one thing you definitely get a sense of reading the initial outline, then watching the finished film as I did last night, you know, the ambiguity that we keep mentioning, it's so carefully honed. So in, in, the, in the outline from early on, as, as you alluded to, there's that flashback in which um, uh, Jack gets into a physical altercation with one of his students. There's also kind of a bit more sort of, uh, the film's a bit more front loaded in uh, Danny, in terms of the supernatural elements. Danny has this, this sort of seizure earlier on in the film, a trance where he, um, he sort of has all these visions. Now in the finished film, the, the, taking out that physical altercation where we see that Jack has this capacity for violence, the question becomes much more amplified of like, well, is it the hotel that's making him crazy? And making him violent or is there something innate in him that's violent and similarly with the supernatural stuff you know uh the, the only kind of moment in the finished film i think where you can inarguably say something supernatural has happened there is when the freezer door opens so um but even then you don't see it happen yeah, it's a sound it's true. off screen <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah i mean when asked after the film came out whether he thought the ghosts were real in the film, Stanley did answer on a few occasions that yes, he did. He believed that this wasn't, he didn't say it this explicitly, but that it wasn't just stuff happening in Jack's head, but that there actually were ghosts in the hotel. He, yeah. he, did, he did believe that. Um, but he, yet he still left a lot of things ambiguous. That moment where Jack is let out of the larder, uh, which as you said, is the first moment where something is actually physically happening that's helping the character. In the finished film, you just hear the disembodied voice of Grady off screen talking to him. And when the door is opened, you're just hearing the sounds of it. So he's not, Stanley's not being explicit. However, when he shot that scene, and I have stills of this in the book, he actually filmed Grady on the other side of the door <laughs> in his tuxedo, having his whole side of the conversation. And as it was originally scripted, but I don't think they shot this, when Jack was let out, he was going to find Grady not there, but the ax on the table, like left for him. Because there's no explanation in the film about where he gets the ax, he just suddenly has an ax. So again, it's like choice after choice after choice of how do we strip away spoon feeding a story to the audience? How it was very intentional to, to leave many, many things uh, ambiguous. Even to the end of the film, uh, there's famously, uh, there, was, there was an epilogue to The Shining uh, that Stanley shot where uh, we see Wendy in the hospital, Wendy and Danny at the hospital, and Stuart Ullman, the manager of the hotel who interviews Jack at the beginning, he shows up and goes and talks to Wendy and basically says, I know you've told all these stories about what happened, but we, you know, everyone was up there and they didn't find anything, uh, which leaves her kind of feeling gaslit. <laughs> Um, so he shot that scene and he was, by all accounts, he was very indecisive about whether it should be in the film or not. During the editorial process, it was in, it was out, it was in, it was out. And 
as it was told to me, his daughter Vivian ultimately um, uh, convinced him to leave it in. And so The Shining was released in limited release uh, in New York and um, uh, Los Angeles, and it had that scene. So there are people who saw that scene in the film when they first went to see The Shining. But a few days into the release, Stanley finally changed his mind for good and said, no, I don't want that scene in the film. And so he hired editors to uh, go to every theater in each of those cities to physically cut the scene out of the film. <laughs> it's kind of unprecedented. I've never heard of a story like that That's before. Wild. Changing a film after it's been released in that way. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's been this kind of long forgotten scene that uh, you know he, he supposedly destroyed and uh, nobody's ever been able to see it again. I actually got my hands on some images from that scene that nobody's ever seen before that are in the book that uh, should make diehard Shining fans very happy. <laughs> um, the other thing I just want to touch on, whenever I talk about the film with people in the UK, it's very interesting because people in the UK have long seen a different version of The Shining yeah, than yeah. I grew up with, that I saw in the US. And it's because after The Shining was released in the U.S. and got a lot of bad reviews, I think Stanley maybe panicked a little bit and, and second-guessed himself. Um, that film was, was cut right up to the bitter end, right before the release. So he was very rushed in the end. And I think he, now that he had a moment to reflect, he decided to do some further editing of the film. So he ended up cutting out 20-odd you know, minutes out of the film. And it just makes the film even more ambiguous. Yeah. You were talking about this notion of establishing that Jack had a violent streak in him um, and how that flashback of him attacking the student kind of set that up. In the American version of the film, um, there's a scene at the beginning of the film after Danny has a kind of a, you know, a trance and has a vision of the bloody elevators. There's a subsequent scene where a doctor comes to the house, played by Ann Jackson, and examines Danny and talks to him, and we learn about Tony. And she then has a conversation with uh, with Wendy out in the living room. And Wendy ends up telling um, the doctor a story about how uh, Danny had injured his arm. He had dislocated his shoulder. And when the doctor asks how that managed to happen, Wendy kind of reluctantly and with embarrassment explains that Jack did it to him. Yeah. Um, and it's a, I, mean, I think it's a really powerful scene, and I, I personally think it's very important to have a seed of knowing what Jack has done in the past and what he's capable of. I think it gives a, a, a certain tension. And by removing that scene completely, I've watched the, the UK cut, I actually find it a bit confusing and maybe too ambiguous. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of, it just makes it that much more difficult to understand Jack's descent into, uh, you know, becoming kind of nuts. Um, but, you know, I talked to Leon Vitale, who was uh, Stanley's longtime assistant, who sadly just passed away a few months ago. And I said, well, which version was Stanley's, which was the definitive version in Stanley's mind? And he said, the UK cut, definitely. That was the one he was ultimately happy with. And I said, well, then why does the U.S. version still exist? Like, why didn't he just? Why why are all the versions on video um, the, the the American version in America? And he said that Stanley had a philosophy that whatever version of a film of one of his films that came out in a certain territory it, that was to always be in perpetuity that version of the film. So it's the only one of his films where there are two versions. And I don't even know that there are any other films. Maybe there are, but I don't know of any where there are two versions of the film that simultaneously exist. We, we talked a little bit about Wendy. Um, it, one, one of Kubrick's earliest notes when assembling the kind of galleys of King's novel was that Wendy could be strong. She could get satisfaction from Jack's failure and problems. She doesn't leave him because she needs to feel his weakness and frustration. And a, a moment ago, you said about how fascinated Kubrick was by the idea of marriage. And um, it seems like here uh, in his kind of earliest vision for the, for the film that maybe there was a bit more of a kind of like uh, back and forth between the two in terms of like their, their struggle. It seems like an idea that maybe got sandpapered down a bit. Um, can you tell a me lot, about? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me about sort of like the iterations you saw of Wendy as a character and, and why you think it kind of panned out that yeah. way? Yeah. Uh, I I mean I don't know that I can speak to the why of it all because that's ultimately in Stanley's head. <laughs> yeah. Um, but 
in, in Stephen King's novel, Wendy is a very strong, self-assured character. Um, and when they started doing the adaptation, when Stanley and Diane started doing the adaptation, she remained a strong character. And, and like you said, there, there was more of an equal back and forth between the two characters. And actually through much of the writing that Diane did on the film, uh, Wendy remained a, a, a pretty strong character. Um, and Diane actually wrote a lot of Wendy's scenes. Um, when Diane's time on the film came to an end and she went home, it was a it was a long time before she then came back at, to do a little bit more work and to see the film, at, at, you know, starting into production. And she was kind of dismayed to find that Stanley had continued to work on the script and had stripped away a lot of that strength out of Wendy. Uh, and and also in the casting of Shelley Duvall, you know, you know somebody who's kind of meek. And, um, you know, we definitely don't see her as a, as a strong woman, though ultimately at the end, it needs to be said that she, she does save her son. Yeah. Right. So she, she does triumph in the end, uh, despite everything. Um, yeah, Diane, Diane talks a lot about how she, she feels that that was a mistake, um, to winnow Wendy's character down to, um, someone who, who, who doesn't have that strength. As to the why, you know, I really don't know. I mean, one thing Stanley would talk about is that he ultimately thought that Wendy's character needed to be someone who the audience hated a little bit, despised a little bit. Really? Yeah, and, and that was part of why he cast Shelley. You know, like he wa- I think he wanted her to be a bit irritating and, and for you to not understand why someone like Jack Nicholson would be married to, uh, uh, to, to, a, to a character like her, to a woman like her. Uh, and again, I don't, I, I wish I could say why. I wish I could give you that definitive answer, but there was clearly something that was, um, I, you know, here, here's one thought. At the end of the film, you know, Shelley, uh, Wendy is basically running around trying to save her son and she's frantic and crying and distraught. Um, and a lot of people criticize that. But I think what Stanley was trying to do was um, not give the audience any hope. You know, by creating a character who's so put upon, and uh, who's so browbeaten, um, you don't really have any faith that she's going to be able to do anything to remedy the situation Mm -hmm. and that she's not going to have the strength to save her son. That's just a thought, that that Stanley did that in an attempt to kind of make the audience feel pretty hopeless by the time we got to the end of the film about how things were going to work out. But as I said, she, she does ultimately triumph. And uh, I'd be remiss not to ask about the the elevator sequence and sort of your discovery of, uh, yeah, how that came to be in the film. It's such an iconic, not just, it's not just an iconic piece of the film, it's an iconic piece of cinema at this point. How much of your adoration for The Shining it stems from just how stunning that image is of the blood pouring out the elevators? And uh, yeah, what did you learn over the course of making the book about that sequence? Well, yeah, it's absolutely a very powerful, iconic image. And interestingly, um, it was one of the very last things shot yeah. on the production. Um, one of the very interesting things to me reading all the different iterations of the screenplay is that I think the screenplay for Stanley was all about structure and dialogue. When it comes to purely visual components, visual storytelling, there's very little in the script. Um, when he talks about Danny having a vision, he, they just write things like Danny has a horrific vision. But he didn't know what it was going to be yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you see that all throughout. And a lot of the purely visual uh, scenes, with a few exceptions, are, are, are not worked out. They're just kind of written about very broadly. Um, <clears throat> A lot of that was just in Stanley's head as he came up with these ideas and he didn't even communicate them with people until he was ready to execute them. So Diane claims that, uh, that Stanley told her about this idea of having blood pour out of the elevators early on. Um, she's the only person who, uh, who I heard that from. Um, but when, when it did come time to finally execute it, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a, a gargantuan task to figure out how to do it technically. You know, I talked to Alan Wibley, who was in charge of special effects at that time on the production. And, you know, they had to build these special tanks behind the elevator doors that, that could hold that huge volume of blood. And 
Um, it wasn't really blood, but fake blood. Um, they actually built that whole set in a in a water tank on the on the Elstree back lot, and they set up multiple cameras shooting at different speeds. And crew members were hidden in boxes behind the cameras so that they would be protected. And but they you know they only did it one time. It was like a one and done kind of thing. And Stanley was actually so nervous about whether it was going to work that once it was all set up and they were ready to roll cameras, he walked off the set. And he he asked Leon Vitali, his assistant, to to roll cameras and and to call action, because he was just so nervous about how it was going to come off. And uh, they did it, and it worked beautifully. And uh, you know, Stanley was ultimately very very proud of how it came out. And it's a fun little moment in the book because Leon Vitali describes uh, Kubrick as being kind of like a proud little boy that his uh, <laughs> that, that this idea that he came up with uh, you know was executed so brilliantly and we've we've uh, we've listed some of the different uh, iterations of the ending there's even a moment in the book where you describe how Kubrick had inquired about sort of buying a hotel so he could blow it up uh, you know it seemed like there was a moment where he was contemplating a more explosive ending in and these are the these North. are like second and third hand stories that I'm recounting so <laughs> yeah. they're not they're not coming out of Stanley's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, in, in terms of the ending they did land on, what to you just as a fan of the film is is so perfect about that note that they end the movie on and sort of Jack's frozen face in the, in the maze? Well, I mean, it's the idea that he is now forever part of the Overlook. And, and uh, you know, I mean, it's a very Kubrickian image, right? It's just, it's very cold and... Um, you know, it's the, the expression on Jack Nicholson's face is very uh, pushed, <laughs> very Kubrickian. Uh, he's almost cross-eyed. Yeah. In that moment, um, I found something in the Kubrick archive that nobody's ever seen, and I've had to kind of figure it out myself because I've spoken to. Les Tompkins, the art director, I've spoken to any number of people about this and nobody has any re recollection of it. But there's a moment early in the film where Jack is wandering around the, the hotel with writer's block and he ends up wandering into the hotel lobby and he approaches um, kind of a model of the maze and he's staring down at that maze and Kubrick cuts to a direct overhead shot, not of the maze model sitting in the lobby, but almost like a maze in Jack's mind. It's, it's a much larger, much more elaborate version of a maze. And the camera just slowly, slowly zooms in on that. And you ultimately realize that we're actually seeing a tiny Wendy and Danny walking around in the middle of the maze. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, it's, it's, it's just such a cool shot. And it just speaks of kind of what's starting to happen in Jack's mind. So what I discovered in the archive is that they actually took that same kind of oversized, overly elaborate maze, and they created a, a snow-encrusted version of it. I have frames in the book of this snowy version of the, of the maze, and sitting in the middle of it is a tiny frozen jack. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so... Uh, just through all of my spelunking and analyzing, I think that I, I don't know if Stanley ever actually used it. He, he definitely shot it. I don't know if he ever even put it in a cut, but the sequencing would have been that um, after uh, we see Jack kind of collapse in the maze at night and, and, and you know, is just kind of being over, overcome by the cold, um, Stanley's original intention is that we were going to cut to a wide shot of Jack frozen in the snow and slowly zoom in on his face and finally find him there. He ended up only using the last bit of that shot, which is just the, 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 the close-up of Jack Frozen. But I think his intention was to then cut or dissolve, perhaps, to this overhead version of this tiny Jack in the maze, which would then slowly widen to see him just like lost in the, in the labyrinth. <laughs> and that would then transition to the hospital epilogue. So, Interesting idea. I don't think he. I, I don't. I don't have any record that he ever used it because nobody remembers it. But he did shoot it. <laughs> oh, it's such a perfect ending. Um, so Lee, we spoke at the beginning, kind of off off air, about how um, about yeah, what it's like to complete 
a decade long project like this. Um, and where it leaves you now and where it leaves your relationship with this film. And you, you mentioned that uh, you're very curious to see what happens now in terms of your relationship with your film. Your wife is very, very curious. <laughs> um, in terms of like, uh, yeah, sort of being able to draw a line under this movie, having, having made something so exhaustive in its chronicling of, of the kind of creative process behind it. Do you feel now that like, uh, you know, have you, have you started to look ahead? If you start to think about what your next project is, you obviously kind of like left Pixar in 2019 on a massive high, having, uh, you know, released Coco a few years previously. Um, yeah, what does the future look like for you? So <laughs> finishing this book culminates, you know, 10 years of work, but it also culminates over four decades of obsession with this <laughs> film. I don't know what life is going to be like for me regarding The Shining after this, having done this. I mean, I've, I've created my, my, my opus work. I've, I've, I've done something productive with my own personal crazy obsession. So, I, you know, I don't know. I live in fear that new photos will come to light or new <laughs> stories will come to light that are not a part of the book, but hopefully that won't happen. My wife, as I mentioned, is very curious to know what life after The Shining is going to be like. Um, she would often joke that I needed to write a book about the making of the book, because <laughs> even the, 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 the development of the book over the years had a lot of twists and turns and many junctures at which it was nearly completely derailed. Um, she, she saw me as Jack a bit, kind of typing away uh, with the all work and no play pages in the creation <laughs> of the book. And since I actually do own one of the axes from the film and it's in our house, that... that uh, That's quite unnerving for yeah, her. Yeah, that, that's probably a bit <laughs> unnerving for her. Um, so, yeah, in terms of The Shining, you know, I, 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 I think this is probably the end of that road, which is strange. In terms of my other work... Um, you know, I yeah, I did. I left Pixar a few years ago after 25 years um, of very, very hard work, but very rewarding work. Um, I just I needed to slow down my life a bit. I think you know, we many people you, you hit an age where you start to become aware of the time that you have left, and you think long and hard about how you want to spend that time. And so I made a choice to step off the merry-go-round and. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with my son before he finally went off to college, which was lovely. Uh, my wife and I have in many ways kind of reinvented our marriage and our relationship. Um, it's just, it's been really lovely to just stop and live and be a human yeah. and not be in the daily rat race of making film, which, I mean, I love film. It's my life, but I need to, I need to be a human as well. So I think I will now that this project is done, I imagine I'll get antsy at some point and want to create again. Uh, but I don't have any plans right now, and I and I really like that I don't have any plans right now. It, all, it 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 disappoints people to give that answer because, you know, I'm flattered that they like the movies that I've made and they want more, um, and and perhaps that'll happen. But I you know I can rest at night knowing that I I have accomplished a lot and I've made a lot of things that have brought a lot of joy and meaning to people's lives and. Um, you know, not everyone gets to experience that. So I'm very grateful. I can only imagine. I mean, just anecdotally, like the number of people I know whose thought process around death has been impacted by Coco, for example, it must be really rewarding as a storyteller, as a director to kind of presumably continue to meet people who have th those sort of messages about their, f about your films. You know, well, same I, again I, with Toy Story. Yeah, yeah definitely friendship. with Coco. I mean, I, yeah, I got it on Toy Story 3 as well. Just, you know, notions of growing up and saying goodbye and, and your transforming role as a parent. I mean, there, there are a lot of themes that emerge in Toy Story 3 that really spoke to people. And the same with Coco. Um, to this day, I, I have people write to me or come up to me to tell me how meaningful the film was to them and how it helped them through the loss of loved ones. Um, ultimately, the thing I'm most proud about with Coco is the, the impact it's had on culture in Mexico yeah. and in the, um, the Latin American community. Um, it's, I mean, I can't even put into words how, how meaningful it has been for so many people and how beloved the film is. And... I'm like endlessly proud of that because I spent the whole making of the film really worried about whether it was going to be accepted or not. 
because I was a white guy telling yeah. a story about another culture that was not my own. Um, and I, 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 I took every step that I could to immerse myself, to surround myself with cultural, cultural advisors, to do everything right. Every decision I made in that film was made through the lens of whether it was culturally um, respectful mm. and accurate. And it was a lot of work. It was, it was like kind of like making two movies. It was all the difficulty of just developing a story, which is already very difficult, but also having to you know, run it through those other filters. Um, and the fact that the movie was so embraced. I mean, for, for a good long while, Coco was the biggest movie ever in Mexico. I'm not just talking about animation. Like, of all movies, it was the biggest movie beyond Avengers films, beyond anything. And, uh, like, I never could have dreamed that that was going to be the case while we were making it. Um, and not just also the fact that it, it, it has given an opportunity for uh, children all over the world to look up at the screen and see somebody who looks like them when that doesn't ha happen very often. Yeah. Uh, especially in a big, you know, Disney you know, studio film. So, yeah. I think after Coco, I had a bit of a mic drop moment in my mind. It ended up being so rewarding that I didn't, I felt like I didn't want to try to chase that again. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, if, you know, if I do anything, my attitude now is if I'm going to make something, it needs to be something that I feel needs to be in the world. I don't just want to make disposable entertainment. I don't want to just make another movie to tell another story. I want to, I want to make something that's going to move the needle a bit and, and kind of has earned its place being in the world. That's my personal attitude. Well, two things to pick up on there. Number one, I have no idea how you managed to make a film that would involve that much exposure to the song Remember Me, because I, I'm just obliterated every time I hear that song. I don't know how you managed to get through every day having to hear that piece of music and uh, yeah, not crumble to pieces. The second thing to say, I suppose, is um, it sounds from that that like when you talk about not chasing that again, because it was such a high, do you think like... Um, your next project as and when it may happen do you think then it might be live action and do you also think like having written this book and having such affection for the shining that you'd ever do a horror movie i would love to do a horror movie i would be very intimidated by the prospect of doing a, a horror movie the the only horror films that i really really like tend to be ghost stories yeah you know i mean i grew up watching slasher films and loved all that growing up but i don't I, I don't really watch movies like that now. I think once you become an adult and have kids, you maybe get a, a, a bit of distaste for that. Um, but I, I like really good ghost stories. That's why I like The Shining. Some of my other favorite films are The Orphanage. Uh, I know you had the, the screenwriter on your podcast. I listened yeah. to it. I loved it. Um, I love the movie The Others, uh, The Innocents. Um, another favorite of mine is The Babadook, which is not a ghost story, but... Um, Here's the thing, if, like when I look at these films, the common thread for me, and it, I guess it does relate to the kinds of stories I've chosen to tell in my own films, is uh, I like a good fright. I like to feel unsettled and, and scared, but I need an emotional component as well. Um, sadly and interestingly, The Shining doesn't fit that. Yeah. The Shining is not an emotional film. Although there is one moment in The Shining that affected me last night in a way that uh, had never affected me before, and I can circle back to that. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, the orphanage just destroys me. Every time I see it, I'm just like a, a weeping mess at the end. It's so powerful. Same. Um, and I, I so admire, and the screenwriter, I, sorry, I don't remember. Sergio G. Sanchez. Yes. Yeah, he he talks about that in, in his interview with you kind of the, the, the delicate task of making a, a frightening film that is also, you know, heartbreaking and emotional. Most horror films don't have that component. And the ones that I like do. They're very few. And I think if I were to make something, it would have to be, it would have to fulfill that. Yeah. So I'd be uh, threading a needle bit, a bit if I were to try <laughs> to do that. In terms of whether I would do a live action film, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I would be... Uh, happy to do that. And I did do some live action early in my career. I got very spoiled at Pixar and in animation by working in a medium where there are very few compromises. 
you know, whatever I could dream up, I could execute whatever camera move, whatever uh, set, anything. I mean, it's, it's, there, there are almost no compromises to be had. And that's not the case in live action. Live action is constant compromise. And, uh, and that can be good because good ideas, good new, good ideas can come out of, um, you know, technical limitations or location limitations or whatever. Um, yeah, I would maybe do that, but again, it would need to be something that I felt needed to be in the world. <laughs> and oh, just so to circle back to yeah, the Shining Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I actually got a little teary at one moment in The Shining last night, which uh, really surprised me. There's a moment later in the film where Wendy is in the apartment uh, kind of fretting. I believe it's after... No, it's prior to the scene where she discovers Jack's pages and, and you have the whole scene with the bat on the staircase. There's a scene where she's kind of pacing in the apartment, fretting, try, you know, talking out loud th through ideas of what she can do. Like, how can she save Danny? How can they get out of there? And in the midst of that, all of a sudden you start hearing this really creepy voice coming from the next room, which is Danny saying Red Rum again and again for the first time. And Wendy rushes in and Danny's sitting up in his bed and he's in this kind of catatonic state, uh, just saying Red Rum over and over again. And Wendy's trying to shake him out of it. Uh, you know, again, really upset, like what the hell is going on with my kid? And Danny stops and he turns to her with this very empty, cold look. And in his Tony voice, he says, Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. And and freaks Wendy out, like, what the hell is happening? Um, that moment, I don't know why, it just really affected me. This idea that this child was now, like, so traumatized that he had completely retreated and some part of himself had uh, had stepped forward as a defense mechanism, you know? Um and I, I found it really moving. Danny looks different in that moment than he ever does in the film. His hair is almost different. He's like a different character. Yeah, yeah. He has kind of a part in his hair, and he has a different expression on his face than he ever does. And I don't know. There was just something watching that I really felt for Wendy in that moment of, on top of all the other trauma she's already been going through, now it's like she's lost the son that she knows. And it's been replaced by this, like, empty uh, shell and a voice and a... And a, and a persona that she doesn't recognize and I found myself welling up in that moment it's never happened before so I just say that to say that <laughs> in as much as I think The Shining is not an emotional film I managed to find a little emotional <laughs> moment in it what a great marker of the journey that you've been on with this film in the you know you, we, we spoke at the beginning about how when you first saw the film it was Danny who you were able to kind of identify with because there was overspill into your own life and now all these decades on, you, it sounds like you view it, view it through the lens of a parent. Yeah, I do, definitely. I can't relate to Jack at all, of course, because I've <laughs> never wanted to murder my family. Um, but Wendy, certainly. You know, sh poor Shelley has taken a lot of uh, flack over the years for her performance, but it is a brilliant performance. She is so good. I think yeah. she's so well cast in the version of the story that Stanley chose to tell. Um, and, and I think Shelley's just amazing. Yes, she's crying and hyperventilating throughout the last third of the film, but who wouldn't? Her her husband is trying to kill her and her son, and she's alone, and there is no chance of rescue. How are you supposed to behave? You know, of course she's behaving like that. I actually have a, a quote I'd love to read here yeah. um, from Steven Spielberg. Uh, this was something he said to me that um, didn't manage to make it into the book or the foreword, but um, I, I just really like it. Uh, and I plan to read this to Shelley. I'm, I'm going to visit Shelley and give her a copy of the book once it's released. And I'm, I'm going to tell her this because it's so great. Spielberg said, Ultimately, the only thing in the story that can save little Danny is Wendy. But Wendy seems weak. So all the suspense for me is, will Wendy be strong enough to stand up to Jack and save her son? And that's why Shelley Duvall's performance is, I think, equal to Jack Nicholson's. Her performance is as good as Jack's, and Jack's is as good as Shelley's. You know, poor Shelley, you know, was given a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Actress the year uh, The Shining came out, and it's been recently rescinded yeah, uh, by so. them. Um, 
because you know people believe how she was treated poorly on the set, which is great, greatly exaggerated, completely exaggerated from the truth. But regardless, they should rescind that because, you know, I think Shelley did a really, really great job, and she did exactly what was asked of her mm. in that film, and uh, and I, I I think she did a you know heartbreaking, really uh, beautiful job of it. Well, Lee, we should wrap things up because you have an exciting afternoon ahead, don't you? I am. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be going out to Chittickbury, uh, Stanley Kubrick's estate, and we're going to be having kind of the official unveiling party uh, for the book. Um, most of the Kubrick family will be there. Uh, uh, some of the actors from the film, Lisa and Louise Burns, who oh, wow. play the Grady twins, yeah, will be there. Yeah, yeah. They're lovely. I love the life they live now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, I spent years trying to find them. Yeah, and I finally found them, and they said, "Oh, we've we've always been here," but they they weren't living a public life. <laughs> That's a very shining. fitting way to put it. Uh, but uh, now they very much embraced and, and enjoy that that uh, you know forty five years later, you know, people love uh, their roles. <laughs> uh, some of the crew members will be there as well, and it'll be really fun to share the book with everybody and kind of celebrate uh, it coming out into the world. Yeah, well, it's a huge, huge accomplishment, Lee. And just as a fan, I'm I'm so grateful that you've made it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. It has been such a blast. As I say, this is uh, this is the first time we've done an episode where uh, we're not talking with the, with the screenwriter responsible for a film. It's been something new for us, but it's been an absolute delight. So thank you very, very much. Oh, good. It was fun uh, talking with you. Thank you. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>